Uh, on the data protection side, kind of already mentioned that it's really people accidentally, accidentally deleting data. You know, um, I have seen this in a production system, a mission critical production system, where someone they went through the right channels, they submitted a ticket, it got approved, change control approved it. Um, the thing is, the people approving it are, don't know T SQL, so they didn't actually look at the syntax of the script, but it was actually a delete on the master table without a where clause. You know, so once that was ran, the entire app was down. Uh, it was down down for over an hour. You know, just trying to recover from that from that uh, that, that data loss. You know, so these are things to think about. Um, you know, as you're designing your plan. So let's talk about how what, what comprises a SQL Server database. Um, in its simplest form, it's made up of data files and log files. Um, it you know, it can have multiple data files and it can have multiple log files, even though that's not recommended because they're written to in a sequential manner. Um, it, you know, in, in its simplest form, it's made up of data and log files. Now we're going to take a look at a little bit of an advanced form, and this is kind of the the, the model I'm going to be using for my demo. So in this picture, you know, we, we have data and log files. You can see the log off to the right up there, sales underscore log dot LDF. But then on the data files, I actually have broken into different file groups. You know, a file group is just a, a logical grouping of files. Um, underneath each file group, I've got three different files. And somebody might ask, why would you architect something this way? Um, well, I might want to put my indexes on, on, on a separate disk than my data, you know, to, to, for performance to new reasons. You know, I want to distribute that I/O. So, so this is a very actually, I, I call it a best practice is to take advantage of these multiple file groups. Um, another example of multiple file groups is you have archive data. You put those in an archive file group, and it, it, you know, it, it, it's a point in time that can become read only, and you can make that file group read only, and you can exclude it for maintenance, you can exclude it for backups, stuff like that. So, this is a lot, a lot of architecture decisions go into, you know, kind of scaling out your database design. And, and, and to me, you know, when it comes to being able to restore um, and, and meet those RPOs and RTOs, that all starts with the architecture of the database itself, um, which is kind of shown in this picture, you know, we, 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 how, how you want to lay things out. Um, another good use I've seen of file groups is uh, an imaging app, okay? So, it, you know, it's got 100 tables. The database is 200 gig. But 195 gig of that is one table that holds a bunch of binary images. So if we put those on their own file group, then we've only got five gigs of, of data to manage. You know, for the app to be up, they just wouldn't be able to see their images. You know, so in the event of a disaster, I, I only have to recover five five gigs to bring the app back online, and then we can work on restoring those images. You know, as users are still able to get in and, and do work, they just wouldn't have access to those images. So. Um, those are a few examples of, 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 of how, you know, you can take advantage of these multiple file groups. But this is kind of an advanced view of, uh, of database files. So let's talk a little bit about recovery models. Um, SQL Server has three different recovery models, full, bulk, bulk locked, and simple. Um, and for those of you who aren't aware, when you create a database in SQL Server, it's going to inherit the properties of the model database. By default, after you do a SQL Server install, the model database is a full recovery mode. And I see this all the time. Development boxes uh, that have a 150 gig log file and a one gig data file. Because someone created a database, you know, not, not taking into account that, that model, um, recovery model, and they haven't been doing any transaction log backup. So basically every transaction ever since that database has been created is just sitting there blowing the log file up. Um, so that, that you know, full, full recovery is basically your log won't be truncated or, or, or flushed until you perform a log backup. Um, to manage the size of your log file for recovery purposes, you know, I highly recommend you set up transaction log backups on databases that are in full recovery mode. Um, full recovery mode is required for point in time recovery. Uh, you know, which which means you're, you're going to be restoring transaction log backups. You cannot restore. You can't back up the transaction log in simple recovery mode, for instance. You know, so so full recovery mode or bulk log recovery mode, either one of those can be used for, for, for point in time recovery. The difference in full and bulk logs is bulk operations like insert bulk, BCP, those are minimally logged. You know, they're basically logged that the event occurred. They don't log um, the row by row operation. So 
you know, those are the two. I, I rarely have seen bulk log used. I, I know it has a place in the industry. Um, you know, just through my experience, I've, it's, I've never come across a, a, a reason to have to use bulk log. Um, but basically, that, the difference it didn't fool is that it minimally, minimally logs the bulk operations. I would also recommend log backups on bulk log recovery model because the log won't get flushed until the log backup is taken. Um, now, th that takes us to simple recovery mode or recovery model. Basically, the log is truncated at each checkpoint. You can't take transaction log backups. You don't have the, the ability to do point in time recovery. That's what normally what you're going to see in, uh, 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 I guess a good business case for that is I've got a database that gets refreshed once a night from another system or from flat files that come in from a client. Basically, there's an ETL process that runs, and it truncates and reloads this database every night at 11 p.m. Well, at 12 p.m., I'm going to just take a full backup, and I'm done. You know, data's not changing throughout the day. So that, that would be a good candidate for simple recovery. Another other good candidate would be a development or QA environment. Unless you're actually testing the, how it affects your app or how it affects the log files, certain functionality within your app, you know, you, you could you could have dev in non-production environments set to simple recovery mode. You know, that just eases the management. But what I've seen uh, far too often is, you know, people do the default next, next, next when they install SQL. So model comes comes through with a full recovery mode. People create new databases. Well, it pulls the properties of model, and all of a sudden all their dev databases are in full recovery mode, and their log files are 100 times bigger than their data file. That, that's not that's not the situation you want to be in. And you'll, I think you'll understand that why when we get to the to the recovery part and what happens uh, when you do when you do recovery. Chad, did we lose you? You know what? You did lose me. <laughs> I accidentally hit a button on my headset. Sorry. No problem. I've been talking away. <laughs> um, let me start back over on this slide. So let, let's, we're going to talk about the, the, the basic backup types. So we have a full backup, differential backup, and, and log backup, or transaction log backup, as, as people call it. 